Thank you, choir, for leading us through the throne of grace, through the ministry of music. Let me encourage you this morning to open up your Bibles to the 119th Psalm, and also in the New Testament to Timothy's second epistle, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Today we're talking about why the Bible is our authority. And so today, as you make your way through this message, I'm going to encourage you to keep your Bibles open because we're going to kind of wander through the Word of God and point out several passages of Scripture to you. And uh, you have a detailed outline uh, inside your order of worship that you might want to follow along with this morning to kind of help you. You can go back and And look at this because so many times the Bible is discredited by skeptics. And they'll say that, you know, it's just a bunch of fairy tales. It's just made up of myths and stories that never happened. Well, we're going to kind of walk you through today and kind of disprove all of those theories. Because this is the Word of God. But we got to get to a place where we not just defend the Bible, but the Bible becomes a part of our lives. You know, I've, I've always found it interesting that if you say a disparaging word about the Bible to almost anybody who's a church member, well, they'll quickly come to the defense of the Word of God, but rarely read the Word of God. So if you want to know God better, and you want to grow in your relationship with him as Savior and Lord of your life, you cannot do it apart from studying God's Word and spending time with him. That's how God reveals himself to us. So if you come on Sunday mornings and and you just want to get a dose of religion that's going to get you through the week, it might help for a little bit. But we're going to find how this morning how important God's Word is to all of us. Now, to honor the reading of God's Word, if you would please stand. The 119th Psalm. And if you've ever been to Vacation Bible School, uh, ever said the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag, this is where this comes from. It says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And now let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. It says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And this is the word of God for the people of God. And may God add his blessings to the reading of his holy and inspired word. And all God's people together said, thank you. You may be seated. I have with me this morning on the podium three different books. I have a computer manual, I have the Bible, and I have a driver's handbook. The computer manual came with my computer. It's very interesting that they enclosed this book, and they gave me my computer. This book is there to help you, help you understand what your computer can do and what it can't do. It will help you set up your computer. It will help you troubleshoot your computer when you start having a little bit of trouble. The Bible, on the other hand, you might know a little bit more about this book. This book is a book of prophecy. This is a book of history. It contains wisdom, the Gospels, poetry, music, all of those things. It is our instruction book of how we are to live our lives according to God's standards and not our own. Now, this driving manual it is a book that has served me well throughout my life. When I was 15 years old, I mean the day I turned 15, I went down and secured my driver's license. I am so thankful that we have raised the age in the state of Mississippi. But I had never had driver's ed before. 
So what I did was, went and got the book, studied it, probably studied for it more than any test I'd ever taken in my life. Don't you remember back then there were three tests that you had to take? You had to take a test on the signs or the road signs. You had to take a test from the book. Then you had to take the dr driving test. Well, when Tommy Joe and I moved to Kentucky, in order to secure a license in Kentucky, you have to take the written test again. And, and I never will forget, they gave us one of these books and said, you got about 10 minutes to cram. And, and, and I remember us taking the test, and there was a little cubicle that was kind of separating the two of us where I couldn't cheat off her and she couldn't cheat off me. And she's laughing, and I'm laughing. Because we're thinking, how embarrassing is it going to be to fail the test? And then it became a competition, who's going to score higher? Well, we both passed. Well, later on, this book came in handy again. When I was at Canton, Mississippi, we bought two brand new church vans. And in order to drive those vans, you had, had to have a chauffeur's license back then. So you go get the book, and all of our staff marched down and took the test, all passed with flying colors. This book came in handy four years ago. I was on my way back to Decatur, Alabama, making my way through Hamilton, Alabama. And, and if you've ever been over towards Hamilton, Alabama, there is a huge hill as you come into that city. It's just past the Texaco, and the bypass. And uh, I didn't realize that was a school zone, and neither did my foot. And all of a sudden, these blue lights hit me from a highway patrolman. And he pulls me over and says, do you know how fast you were going? And I said, that's really not the issue. The issue is, do you know how fast I was going? <laughs> and he said, I'm going to have to give you a ticket. Well, I went to court, not to fight the ticket, but to find out what I could do for that ticket not to be on my record. So Brother Bill got to go to traffic school. And when you go to traffic school, you have to take a test. And you have to pass the test in order to get out. Well, this book has come in handy. Now, when you look at these three books, Computer manual, the Bible, the traffic book. You know what they have in common? Each is an authority in a certain field. The computer manual, it was produced and written by the people who built the computer. They know what they're talking about. They are authorities in that area. The one who wrote this driving manual. It's, it's produced by those who govern our roadways and, and, and have forgotten more about traffic laws than you and I will ever know. So this brings us to the Bible. This is the Word of God. Christians accept it as their authority for life. So why should we accept the Bible as our authority today? Well, I want to give you several reasons why, and we're going to begin right off the bat with the first one. You and I accept the authority of the Bible because of its claims that it makes about itself. It claims to be the divinely inspired Word of God. You either believe that or you don't. There are no gray areas. You can't say, I will believe this part or I will believe that part. You can't say, I'm a New Testament Christian, not an Old Testament Christian. 
Folks, we are a whole Bible Christian. Every word in this book is inspired by the creator of life himself. Just listen to some of the specific passages of scripture that you will find in God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 70, what we just read, all scripture is God breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has given you this book as a model for how you are to live your life. So that you can do the things that God wants you to do. Look at 2 Peter 1, 21. It says, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we need to realize the Bible claims to be the word of God. So if we believe that this is true, then we believe that it is given to us by God. We also find several uh, references in the Bible where a spokesman was speaking, and when they were speaking, they were declaring that they were speaking the words given to them directly from God. 2 Samuel 23, 2. David says this, The Spirit of the Lord uh, the Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. So what David is saying here is the words that I'm speaking are not my own words. The words that I'm speaking are literally the words given to me by God. Look in Jeremiah, the first chapter, verse 9. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said, I have put my words in your mouth. So not only are we talking about the written word, but the words that the prophets and the servants were speaking directly at that time. Revelation 22, verses 18 through 19. I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share of the tree of life in the holy city, which is described in this scroll. Now, there are a lot of people that believe that this is a weak argument, that we accept the word of God because the word of God says it's the word of God. And when people ask me, what is my view on the Word of God? Is it the inerrant Word of God? I always go back and say this. I believe what the Bible says about itself. And the Bible says, the Word of God is the perfect Word of God. It is our authority because it says it is. And sometimes as parents, you know that that argument is good enough. When your child says, why can't I do this? Or why can't I go there? Why can't I be a part of this? And you say, what? Because I said you can't. And they'll say, that isn't a reason. You say, yeah, it is. And we accept God's word as our authority because the Bible says that it is. Second, we accept the Bible as our authority because of Jesus' view on Scripture itself. Jesus believed that Scripture was literally the Word of God. It was the authority for his life. If you don't believe that, let's look in Matthew. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 18. Jesus spoke these words. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus' view of Scripture as the authority of life is even more apparent by the way he used Scripture to affirm what was true. He affirmed what was true through Scripture. 
And there's no better example of this than when Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness. You'll remember that following the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, our Lord withdraws into the wilderness for a period of, of 40 days. 40 days of temptation. And it's interesting to me that while Jesus is fasting and praying during that time, the evil one comes to tempt him. Now, hold on just for a moment before we get to the temptations. And we need to answer this question. Because I always find it interesting when I ask this question, Christians get that deer in the headlight look. You know, they, I don't know if I should answer that or not. Or should I? Wait, 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 you know. The question we have to ask ourselves is this. Jesus was fully man and he's fully God, right? Anybody got a problem with that one? Okay. So if Jesus is fully man and then he's fully God, you have to come back and ask the question, could Jesus have sinned? Everybody's going, man, I'm making sure I'm not shaking my head either way. Kind of like going to an auction. You know, when you're bidding on stuff, man, you don't want to scratch your nose or anything, do you? Because you're afraid the auctioneer call them. The answer to that question is obvious to me. Of course, he could have sinned. Because if he could not have sinned, then the temptations mean nothing. He chose not to. And he never did. Which makes his life even more astounding. But you turn to Matthew in the fourth chapter. And you have temptation number one. He's tempted by Satan because of his physical hunger. The tempter comes to him and says, well, if you're the son of God, then these rocks over here, why don't you turn them into bread and, and, and just have yourself a nice meal? Notice what Jesus says. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. What is he doing? He's fighting evil with Scripture. He is quoting God's Word. That's temptation number one. Temptation number two. Satan takes him to the highest level of the temple. And he says this. Just throw yourself off the temple. Throw yourself down. And you know that... that, that, that God will send angels to catch you. Look how Jesus answers. It is also written that you shall not test the Lord your God. Fighting evil with Scripture. And then, temptation number three. Satan takes him high upon this mountain. I've always found this temptation to be almost ludicrous to me. Takes him to this high mountain and says, you see, everything on this earth, it will be all yours if you just bow down and worship me. You know what I find interesting there? It wasn't Satan's to give. It already belonged to the King of kings and the Lord of lords because the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And you'll remember that Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Again, fighting evil with Scripture. Now, if that worked with Jesus, wouldn't you think it would work with us? When you impart Scripture into your life, why did Jesus quote Scripture so often? Because it was his authority for living. Now, if Jesus is the Messiah, if he is the Son of God, how do we 
contradict him on this primary conviction of his. You and I accept the Bible as authority, not only because the Bible says it so, but because Jesus said it was so as well. Two pretty good arguments. Three, we accept the Bible for our authority because it has fulfilled prophecies. I love this. There is no other book like this book. And what I'm about to show you is kind of fascinating to me. And I hope that you'll find it fascinating to you as well. We know that the Bible is divided up into two books, right? The first being the what? Say it. Old Testament. And then we have the what? New Testament. The Old Testament is prior to the life of who? Jesus. Okay? But in the Old Testament, those prophets, those saints, had placed their faith in the coming of the Messiah. They were looking forward to that day when God would send his chosen one. And so there are six places, specific places, concerning the Messiah that are fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Number one, the place of his birth. In Micah 5, 2. It comes to fruition in Matthew 2, 1. Second, born of a virgin. Quoted in Isaiah 7, 14. Validated in Matthew 1, 18. Third, that he would come from the lineage of Abraham. First spoke in Genesis 22, 18. Comes to fruition in Matthew 1, 1. The forerunner of the Messiah. That being John the Baptist. Isaiah talked about it in chapter 40, verse 3. It's also mentioned in Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1 comes to fruition in Matthew 3, 1. His vicarious death is mentioned to us in Isaiah 53, verse 8. In great description, it comes to fulfillment in John's gospel, first, I mean, 1 John 2, 2. His execution among common criminals in Isaiah 53, verse 12, comes to fruition in Luke 23, 33. That's pretty incredible. How in the Old Testament, all you have to do is line up the New Testament Jesus to what was written about him Hundreds and thousands of years before he ever set foot on this planet. And it describes him to a T. There is no other book like this. In addition, the Bible contains a number of prophecies relating to specific events in places that have been fulfilled in history. One of those is found in Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel 26. Chapter 26, you can kind of begin in the very beginning. This was a prophecy against the city of Tyre. And the prophet begins to, to, to warn this city about what's going to take place. Now look in uh, verse 3. This is amazing. In verse 3, it says that many nations will rise up against Tyre. In verse 4, it says that the city would be flattened like the top of the rock. It was already predicting 
Destruction's coming. They're going to they gonna level you out like the flat top of a rock. Then in verse 5, it says, Fishermen, no, ex, yeah, no, yeah, it says, Fishermen will spread their nets over the city. That, that, that one kind of sounds weird. How is that going to happen? Fishermen are going to spread their nets over your city. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Then it says, Debris from the city is going to be swept right into the sea. Verse 12. In verse 14, you know what it says? You're never going to be rebuilt again. You're done. History. End of story. Now, you know what the amazing thing about Tyre was? Every bit of that became a reality. Hundreds of years after this is written, it came to fruition in great detail through Alexander the Great. He laid siege on that great city, and many of the inhabitants left to the little islands that were close to Tyre. Alexander destroyed the entire city, and you know what he did? He swept the debris of that city into the sea. Today, if you were to go to Tyre, to the region where Tyre was, it is now a fishing community. And you know what the fishermen do? They hang their nets out to dry at the end of the day after they've been out at sea. You see, this book contains hundreds of prophecies that have been fulfilled with accurate detail. Thousands of years later, there is no other book like this book. The Bible is our authority because of the prophecies that have been fulfilled. Number four. We accept the Bible as our authority because of the, its resistance to attacks that have been made every century. When you think about it, it's literally a God thing that the Bible is even still here. Because over the centuries, people have done what they could to destroy this book. From the beginning of its existence, there have been merciful, merciless attacks on the Word of God. Diocletian, the Roman emperor, called for the destruction of all Christian documents, including the Bible. Voltaire, the famous French philosopher who was a brilliant atheist, wrote tracts that literally took the Bible to task. And he said, in a hundred years, the Bible will be no more. Thomas Paine of the Revolutionary War, who wrote The Age of Reason. He was passionate about the irrelevance of the Bible. And said, it would come a time when we no longer needed it. People have tried to destroy this book. You realize in certain countries, you can't be caught with this book in your hand. People yearn and strive and crave just one page of this book. We are told at the rise of communism in Russia that they would sneak Bibles out. And what believers would do is they would tear sections out of the Bible. And they would read that section, then give it to a friend of theirs. And they would exchange sections so that they could have a part of the Word of God. It has been discarded by the atheist. It has been discounted by the scientists. It has been exaggerated by the extremists. But the Bible has stood the test of time because it is the Word of God. I like the story about the shepherd who wanted to build a fence for his sheep. And he told somebody, he said, I want it built two feet high and three feet wide. And somebody said, why would you build it two feet high and three feet wide? He said, because if it's ever knocked down, it'll be taller than it was before. And that's exactly what's happened to the Bible. 
people have tried to discard it, tried to knock it down, and it turns out it just keeps on getting stronger. It's still on the bestseller list in the New York Times. It is a life-changing book. We accept the Bible as our authority because of its historic reliability. Skeptics have always questioned the historical accuracy of the Bible. And, the, and this is what I find amazing. The more they try to discredit this book, the more this book proves that it's accurate. Let me give you an example. There were many skeptics that said that there was no such man in the Old Testament by the name of Abraham. They said he was a mythical character who never existed. And the reason that they said that was, Scripture tells us that Abraham came from the city of Ur. How would you like to be from Ur? Where are you from? Ur. Where in the world is Ur? It's right over Ur, you know. The city of Ur. So, 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 so for years, you, you, you have these skeptics, these so-called scholars, men and women of letters. No such man as Abraham. But a problem happened. Archaeologists uncovered a city called Ur. And on the columns of some of the remains, imprinted on the columns, home of Abraham. The city of which he was from has been discovered to prove that he was there. Skeptics doubted the story that was told in the gospel. John, the fifth chapter. It's a story about the lame man at Pool Bethesda. For years, that area had not been discovered. And so you have this huge story about, you know, Jesus telling the lame man to, to rise, you know, and you have this whole story about, well, you know, I want to get well, but uh, nobody's here to put me in the water. Well, they never could find the Pool of Bethesda with these colonnades that they said. Obviously, that story is made up. Guess what? They found it. And it was just as it was described in John, the fifth chapter. The Bible has been more scrutinized than any book that has ever been written. And it has proven itself time and time again. Finally, we accept the Bible as our authority because of the impact it has on human life. In despair, the Bible offers hope. Billy Graham tells a story and when you think about just the historical context of this story and the importance of this man and that this man is still with us it's absolutely amazing to me during the dark time in Britain's history Churchill sent for Dr. Graham to come and visit him in London. This young, famous preacher. And Dr. Graham said he went and met with Winston Churchill. Imagine that. And he said that uh, Churchill looked at him and said, Young man, do you see any hope for the world? And Dr. Graham had a pocket Bible in which he pulled it out and said, this book is full of hope. 
And he started reading several passages of scripture out of that book. Churchill said, young man, you've given an old man a renewed faith for the future. In grief, this book offers comfort. One of the most difficult things that I do as a pastor is a funeral service for somebody that you're close to. The words that you speak are sometimes inadequate. But as you gather around that tent and that casket is there on those rollers, and the family is seated there beside you. When you start thinking, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Thomas, one of the disciples, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How in the world do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. The last words that I ever spoke to my Father right before he went on to be with the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside the still waters. As I was quoting those words to him, as I've done countless times to folks who've lost loved ones, in a semi-comatose state, I started watching my father's mouth move with mine as that psalm became his psalm. And those words of comfort became his comfort. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemy, hast anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me, all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's word gives comfort to the lonely. God gives the promise of his presence. When Jesus gave his commission, if you will, to his disciples he told them to go and to preach and to teach all that they had been commissioned baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and you remember what he said at the very end and lo I am with you always even unto the end of the ages that's what flamed the disciples. That's what flamed people like David Livingston. You see, it comes over and over and over to us. Be strong and courageous from the book of Joshua. The Bible speaks to human need like no other book before it and no, ever, no other book after it. It is the word of God. Now I know that in this short period we haven't answered all the books or given you every argument as to why this is our authority. But I will tell you this, my friend. This book makes a difference in a life. For it is this book that assures me that even though I am a sinner, and deserve death. This book tells me 
that there's a God who loved me so much that he sent his one and only son that if I confess him as Savior and Lord, I will not die, but I will live eternally with him. This book has made a difference in this life. It has made a difference in your life. There is a promise that it will make a difference in our continued life. The Word of God. Praise be to Him. Father, we thank You today for Your grace. We thank You for Your mercy. We thank You for Your Word. And we know when it's spoken, it does not come back void. Your Word has been attacked. It has been reviewed. It has been discredited. But Father, it is true every stroke of the pen. And Father, it offers us a way to come to you as we confess Christ as Savior and Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. It will make a difference. But we have to read this book and not only just read it, but we have to let it be a part of our lives on how we treat one another and how we follow you. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It leads us to you. In your son's name we pray. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation this morning.